Before you can even begin analyzing data, you must understand the different types of data. For example, what is the difference between numerical and categorical data? Numerical data represents values that can be measured or counted. It can be split into continuous data and discrete data. Continuous data can take on any value within a range. For example, the inches of rain in a month could fall within 1 and 2 inches. It may be 1.5, 1.68, etc. Discrete data, on the other hand, results from a counting process. So, for example, the number of eggs that a chicken lays per day or a stock's price. The number of eggs is limited to whole numbers and a stock's price is limited to dollars and cents. Let's go back to categorical data, which describes the quality or characteristics of a group of observations and can be split into nominal and ordinal data. Nominal data can't really be organized in a logical order. It is just a set of names or labels. So, for example, labeling companies by industry. Ordinal data, on the other hand, can be logically ordered and ranked. So, for example, the number of stars used to rate a fund's performance can range from one star, which indicates poor performance, to five stars for the best performing funds. However, ordinal data doesn't tell you anything about the numerical differences between categories. We cannot imply that the returns for a two-star fund are twice as good as a one-star fund, and we don't know the difference in the fund's performances based on their number of stars. Depending on how data is collected, it can be classified into three categories. Time series data is when you analyze one variable for one subject at equal time intervals, for example, taking the annual returns for one stock over the last four years. Cross-sectional data is when you analyze one variable for multiple subjects at a single point in time. For example, taking the annual returns of four different stocks in year three. If we combine time series and cross-sectional data, we get a table that can be categorized as panel data, which analyzes one or more variables for multiple subjects over time. In this example, it's the entire table of returns for the four stocks over four years. Notice that the columns in this table are time series data, the rows are cross-sectional data, and the entire table is panel data. You can also categorize data based on how it's organized. Structured data is highly organized and generally has repeating patterns. Think of traditional sources like market data, fundamental data, or analytical data as examples. Unstructured data, on the other hand, doesn't follow conventional patterns or sources. It could be produced by individuals such as social media or web searches, generated by business processes like credit card transactions or filings, or generated by sensors like satellite images or mobile device tracking. That covers the different types and sources of data in this section. Now, let's move on to frequency distributions. Take a look at the temperature in these cities. To construct a numerical frequency distribution, First, we need to determine a set of intervals. The range of temperature for this data set is 36 degrees, so if we want to have four intervals, every interval must contain a range of 9 degrees. So let's label the four bins or intervals. Now we simply have to tally the observations in each bin to get the absolute frequency. Only one city has a temperature between 30 and 39 degrees. There are two cities that fall within the second interval, and so on. But be very careful when counting because the intervals overlap. For example, there are two bins that contain 39 degrees. So if a city has a temperature of 39 degrees like Tokyo, remember to always place it into the higher bin when tallying observations. Two other important factors are relative frequency and cumulative frequency. The relative frequency is always in percentage terms. There are eight observations in total, so one-eighth, or 12.5% of the total observations, fall within the first interval, two-eighths fall within the second interval, and so on. And what about the cumulative frequency? The first interval has one observation. For the second interval, you must include the observations that fall within that interval, as well as the observations in previous intervals so there are a total of three. For the next interval, 
you must add up all the observations on that interval and the ones that came before it, for a total of six. And obviously, the last interval will include all eight observations because you're accumulating them. Notice that cumulative frequency can be written in relative terms as well. Here are the values. Notice that the last item, which includes all observations, has a value of 100%. Now, let's move on to the contingency table, which is a table that shows the frequency distributions of two or more variables simultaneously. For example, here we have the sector in rows and the company size in columns. We can easily see that there are 30 companies that are both energy companies and small cap companies. That's why the values inside the table are called joint frequencies, and the totals for each row and column are called marginal frequencies. Now let's say that you wanted to convert the values into relative frequencies. Here's what you need to do. The total count of observations is 200. So if you take this cell as an example, you simply divide each joint frequency by the total count to get a percentage. Here are all the relative frequencies if you want to solve them for practice. There is a special kind of contingency table called a confusion matrix, and it is used to test the performance of a classification model. So for example, suppose that we have a model that can predict if companies will default on their bond payments and we want to test the accuracy of this model. Here is what the confusion matrix looks like. It compares the model's predicted defaults with the actual defaults. As you can see, the model predicted that 100 companies would default, but only 90 of those actually defaulted. So the model made a mistake in 10 cases where there was no actual default. It also made a mistake in five cases where it predicted that there would not be a default, but there actually was one so the confusion matrix can help you visualize the accuracy of a model. In this next learning outcome, we will review all of the different ways that data can be visualized, so let's briefly review each of these individually. A histogram is used to visualize absolute frequency. So, if these are absolute frequencies, simply place the intervals on the x-axis and the absolute frequency on the y-axis. This is what the histogram looks like. Now, you can quickly see that there are three observations that fall between 48 and 57 degrees. Now let's create a frequency polygon. Just label the midpoint of each interval on the x-axis and keep the frequency on the y-axis. The first interval has one observation, the second has two, and so on. Now you just need to connect the midpoints to create the frequency polygon. To create a cumulative distribution chart, First place the upper limit of the interval on the x-axis and the cumulative frequency on the y-axis. Then simply plot each cumulative frequency on the graph. Now you can quickly see that there are six observations that are below 57 degrees. Notice that this also works for relative cumulative frequencies. So the y-axis now has percentages. And after plotting the line, we can see that according to this chart, 75% of the observations are below 57 degrees. A bar chart is used to visualize the frequency distribution of categorical data. So, in this example, each bar represents a sector. We can easily see that there are 300 companies within the technology sector. Grouped bar charts represent multiple variables at the same time. For example, we can subdivide the stocks in each sector into small cap mid-cap, and large-cap companies. And notice that an alternative way to represent this same data is with a stacked bar chart, which places the subgroups on top of each other rather than next to each other. Moving on to tree maps, which are used to display and compare categorical data. Tree maps are made up of colored rectangles, and the value of each category is proportional to the size of its rectangle. Here, we can clearly see that the technology sector has the largest value. Don't forget that tree maps can include nested rectangles to add more dimensions to the data. So let's add a few nested rectangles to represent small, medium, and large cap stocks within each sector. We can clearly see that small cap technology stocks contains the largest number of stocks. A word cloud is used to visualize the frequency of unstructured textual data. 
Let's say that we take a transcript from a company report and create this word cloud. The largest words are the ones that appear the most frequently in the report. A line chart is used to show the change in data over time and identify trends. So for example, we could plot the quarterly revenue for one or more firms over time. A bubble line chart is a unique type of line chart that is used to represent an additional dimension. So for example, if apart from the revenue, you also want to show earnings per share, the bubble chart allows you to visualize both of these metrics at the same time. A scatter plot is used to visualize the joint variation or correlation of two variables. So for example, here we have a positive linear relationship between stock A and stock B, a negative linear relationship, and no relationship between variables. A scatter plot matrix allows you to visualize many pairs of variables at the same time. Here we can see many different relationships between stocks X, Y, H, and F all at once. And lastly, we have a heat map which displays frequency distributions and can be used to visualize correlations among different variables. Here is an example of a heat map. What separates a heat map from a regular joint table is that a heat map uses a color spectrum. In this example, the dark blue quadrants have the largest number of stocks and the light blue quadrants have the lowest number of stocks. So we've covered all these charts and graphs, but how do you know which visualization type to select? It all depends on what you want to analyze or show. To visualize relationships, these are the most appropriate types of graphs. To make comparisons, it depends on whether you are making comparisons among categories or making comparisons over time. And if you are analyzing distributions, use these chart types for numerical data, these three for categorical data, and a word cloud for unstructured data. Pause the video if you want to review this graph in detail. In this next learning outcome, we will cover measures of central tendency, which are used to specify where the data is centered. These are the statistics we will be looking at, so let's get started. Take a look at this data set. The arithmetic mean is equal to 3.4. To get the median, remember to place the observations in order and select the middle one. If there had been an even number of observations, just get the average of the two values in the middle. The mode is the value that occurs most frequently in the data set, which in this case is the number 3. If you ever have a data set with extreme outliers, you can use the trimmed mean or the winsorized mean to exclude extreme observations. The trimmed mean excludes a given percentage of observations. So for example, a 10% trimmed mean discards the lowest 5% and highest 5% of observations and calculates the mean of the values that remain. The winsorized mean reassigns values to the outliers. So for example, a 10% winsorized mean would assign new values to the lowest and the highest 5% of observations before calculating the mean of the entire data set. Now let's calculate the weighted mean for this portfolio. These are the weights in each stock and the returns of each stock in the portfolio. To get the weighted average, simply multiply the return of each stock by its weight in the portfolio. The weighted mean of the stocks in this portfolio is equal to 9.8%. What about the geometric mean? It is commonly used to calculate investment returns over several periods. So let's say your portfolio earned 14% in year 1, 20% in year 2, and lost 8% in year 3. To calculate the geometric mean, here is the formula that you should use. By multiplying these three returns, you are essentially calculating the return over three years. That's why you take the cube root, because we are looking for an annualized return. A common mistake is to forget to subtract 1 at the end, so watch out for that. Here is the correct answer. Finally, we get to the harmonic mean. Usually you'll use this if you purchase shares at different prices over time and you want to know how much the average cost per share was. So let's say that every month you invest $100 in the stock market. In January, you purchased shares at $6 per share. In February, you bought more of the same company, but the price was now $8 per share. And in March, 
you bought more shares at $5 per share. What's the harmonic mean? Here is the formula, and here are the values plugged in. So essentially your average share price was $6.10 per share. A key point to remember is that when returns are not constant, the harmonic mean will be lower than the geometric mean, which will be lower than the arithmetic mean. When it comes to investment problems, if you are calculating past investment returns, use the geometric mean. If you are estimating a single period return, such as next year's return, use the arithmetic mean. And if you are estimating multi-period returns, such as the returns over the next three years, use the geometric mean. For this next learning outcome, you should know how to divide data into quantiles. Here we have 100 observations to make it easier to visualize. Quartiles divide the data into quarters. Quintiles divide it into fifths, deciles into tenths, and percentiles into hundredths. Notice how the 40th percentile is the same as the fourth decile or second quintile because 40% is the same as four tenths or two fifths. By the same logic, the 75th percentile is equal to the third quartile, and so on. You should also know that the interquartile range is equal to the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile. Now, let's actually apply this in an example. Take a look at the following distribution. What would be the third quartile or 75th percentile of this distribution? To find the position of an observation at a given percentile, we use this formula. N equals the number of observations, and Y equals our percentile. By plugging in values, we get an answer of 8.25. But watch out here, because 8.25 is not the final answer. It's just the position of the observation that we're looking for. So now we must find the observation that lies in the 8.25th place. The very first thing you must do is arrange the data in ascending order. Number 8 lies in the 8th position, and number 10 lies in the 9th position. Let's expand that. We can see that the value in the 8.25th place equals 8.5. Let's place it on this timeline. The value in the 75th percentile equals 8.5. A common mistake students make is to forget to arrange the data in ascending order, so don't forget that step. Another way to visualize quantile data is with a box and whisker plot. This is what it looks like. The plot basically tells you a data set's highest value, lowest value, interquartile range, average, and median. So make sure you can identify each of these items. Moving on to measures of dispersion, which tell us how spread out the data is. Most observations could be lying close to the mean, or there could be a larger dispersion. Here are some common ways to measure dispersion. Let's go over them. Let's say you have a class of four students and they each received the following grades. The range is just the maximum value minus the minimum value, so 21. For the mean absolute deviation, this is the formula. You first find the arithmetic mean, and then you take the sum of each observation's difference from the mean. Remember that they're absolute values. Don't forget to divide by n which is the number of observations. You should get 6.75 as your answer for this example. What about the variance and standard deviation? Here are the variance formulas for a sample and a population. The only difference between the sample and the population variances is the denominator. And don't forget that the standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. However, You'll be happy to know that variances and standard deviations can be found using your calculator. Using the calculator, first you need to enter the observations as x values in the data function, and then the stat function will automatically calculate the measures of dispersion. Let's look at the actual keystrokes. Here are the keystrokes to enter the observations as x values in the data function. Now you have to click second stat, and using the down arrow, you'll see that the calculator has automatically calculated the arithmetic mean, the sample standard deviation, and the population standard deviation. The calculator won't give you the variance, but remember that you can square the standard deviation 
to get the variance. Now you can save time and let the calculator do all the work for you. The standard deviation shows the dispersion of returns below and above a value, but many times, investors are only worried about downside risk. That's why you need to know how to calculate target downside deviation. Here are the quarterly returns for a portfolio. Let's assume that investors have a 2% target return and are worried about returns falling below the target. The first step is to calculate each return's deviation from the target. This is basically the difference between the 2% target and each observation. Since we only care about downside risk, we will focus only on deviations below the target and ignore any positive deviations. The next step is to square the deviations that were below the target and calculate the sum. The final step is to use this formula to calculate the target downside deviation, which should equal 1.77%. You should also be familiar with a coefficient of variation, which expresses the standard deviation relative to the mean. Another way to think about it is as the risk per unit of return. When comparing investments, the higher the coefficient of variation, the more risk that the investor is taking per unit of return. Skewness refers to the extent to which a distribution is not symmetrical. Take a look at the following distributions. This one is symmetrical. This one is positively skewed. And this one negatively skewed. Notice how positively skewed means that it has a right tail, which indicates that it has many outliers in the upper region. So very large gains are possible, but don't happen very often. The mean is closest to the tail, so it is the largest value, followed by the median, and then the mode. A negatively skewed distribution has a left tail, meaning it has many outliers in the negative region. So very large losses are possible, but don't happen very often. The mean in this case is closest to the tail, so it is the smallest value, followed by the median, and then the mode. For symmetrical distributions, all three values are equal. We are almost done with this reading, so let's quickly go over kurtosis. Kurtosis is the degree to which a distribution is peaked. Here we have a normal distribution. Now look at this distribution, which is more peaked than the normal. That's called a leptokurtic distribution. If we have a distribution that is flatter than the normal distribution, it's called a platykurtic distribution. The last term we need to define is excess kurtosis. A normal distribution has a kurtosis of 3, so anything above 3 will be referred to as excess kurtosis. Suppose that this distribution has a kurtosis of 4. That means that it has an excess kurtosis of 1. Let's quickly cover covariance and correlation. Covariance measures how two variables move together. If stock A increases when stock B increases, or falls when stock B falls, then the stocks have a positive covariance. If they move in opposite directions, they have a negative covariance. The problem with covariance is that it's hard to interpret because it can range from negative to positive infinity. That's why many analysts use correlation instead. Correlation measures how two variables move together, but it's scaled so that all values stay between negative 1 and positive 1. If two stocks have a correlation of negative 1, it is a perfect negative correlation, meaning that if one stock increases by 1%, the other stock will fall by the same amount. A correlation of positive 1 means the stocks move in the same direction and by the same amount. Zero just means that there's no correlation between the stocks. You should be familiar with the following formula. Correlation between x and y is equal to their covariance divided by the standard deviations of each. Be careful if the problem gives you variances instead of standard deviations. Scatter plots are a great way to visualize the relationship between two variables. For example, these three scatter plots show a positive correlation, a negative correlation, and no correlation. This is the end of the reading. Well done. For more videos like these, go to wallstreetnotes.com and master the entire CFA curriculum by watching simple animated videos.